in the 18th century, and we are like the people who fought against you know, the, 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 the Jim Crow laws at the beginning of the 20th century, and we are like the gay people who stood up in the 1950s and 60s and said, this is crazy, and every one of them were, you know, were being said, you're crazy, you're quixotic, you're absurd. But ultimately, their vision become something resembling the dominant visions in our society. They may not be totally victorious in any one area, but they became the normative dominant vision. Now we are now entering what might be described as the second real generation of drug policy reform. There was an early period in the 50s, there was an early period with marijuana in the 70s, but in terms of the birth and the growth of the drug policy reform movement, which really began in some respects in the late 80s, early 90s, you guys really are, in some respects, the second generation of what is a multi-generational struggle. So it's making that commitment and it's understanding that some of our victories are behind us, more of them are right in front of us, and that the bigger victories are going to involve taking all sorts of challenges and twists and turns and, and setbacks, and it's going to take years, and it's going to take commitment. You know, there was a moment I remember back in the uh, late 90s when we had won, you know, we legalized the marijuana, so we won the American Marijuana Ballot Initiatives in California, Alaska, Oregon, Colorado, Nevada, and Maine in 96 and 2000. We won Prop 36, the Treatment Center Incarceration Initiative in California in 2000. We won these acid forfeiture reform initiatives in uh, Oregon and Utah. We really, you know, we began to describe ourselves. We had our bumper stickers, the new anti-war movement. And there was a sense of momentum. We done this big international, you know, public letter to the U.S. Secretary General Kofi Annan in 1998 calling for an opening debate. We stunned the establishment. You know, we were beginning. It was the first real wave. And then 2001 hit us. And first it was, you know, the Bush Cheney days. And in the first few months of Bush Cheney, there were still these things that maybe there were some potentials for a Nixon goes to China, Republicans do the right thing, so the people were getting appointed. That didn't pan out. And then 9-11 happened. And probably the single most devastating thing for drug policy reform's progress right then was 9-11. All those bumper stickers about being the new anti-war movement, those went in the trash can, right? The whole notion of that momentum, all of a sudden there were real wars we were engaged in and the population became you know, freaked out about security issues and, and we had to worry about, you know, almost in a way, had the drug war having been the principal vehicle for pushing back civil liberties and human rights for so many years. Now there was the whole anti-terrorism thing and that became this thing. So there was a way in which I remember those years after 2001, 2002, 2003, they were difficult times. Now, I tell you that because what it is to say is that those difficult times also lie ahead. There's going to be these other moments when shit happens, you know? There's going to be these other moments when uh, we get hit with another 9-11 type thing or another war or just something else really weird. You always, the one thing you count on is something you totally did count on happen, right? And sometimes it's going to be a good thing and sometimes it's going to be a bad thing. And so being able to maintain the commitment through that period, to have that faith, to know that you got to keep plugging. You know, I remember there was a, there was a movie, uh, uh, I think about a few years ago, five, six years ago called Amazing Grace, I think it was called. And it was about the guy, Wilbur Wilberforce, who was a leader of the, uh, the British anti-slavery movement in the late, uh, the late uh, end of the 18th century, early 19th century. And the movie starts with him absolutely despondent, just shattered, because he had had this like five or ten years where things were like the wind was in his back, and everything was happening, and then everything, all of a sudden it all fell apart. The Napoleonic Wars took over. There was a shift in the discourse. Some people kind of got too outrageous too fast, and everybody pulled back. There was a change in the leadership, the national leadership, and he was like almost at wit's end and despondent, and he stepped back, and he regrouped, and he identified new allies, and he made up with old allies, and, and they began to, and then you know what happened? The Napoleonic Wars ended, and the government changed, and they were smarter and savvier this time, because they had to deal with the setback. And they came around, and they succeeded in abolishing, you know, the, 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 at first the slave trade, and then ultimately slavery in Britain, and then throughout the British Empire. So it's that kind of thing, recognizing this is a multi-generational struggle, recognizing that you are at the ages of 18 or 19 or 20 or 21 or 22, 
hopefully making a commitment that is going to go on for years and decades to come, and that somehow maybe you will transmit to your children and that your grandchildren will be part of this as well, right? So, that said, I got to tell you, I am so excited right now. The stuff that is going on. Six Central American presidents are gathering in the old capital city of Guatemala, Antigua, for a meeting to talk about what to do about the war on drugs, and where the president of Guatemala, Otto Perez Molina, has said that he wants alternatives to the prohibitionist approach on the agenda. Today, history is being made in Guatemala, right? On the same I can only tell you so much about this. My staff at DPA, my college at DPA know that, that this has been my focus over the last month and a half. But um, I have to say, and, and some of this I can't speak about quite publicly, uh, because some of it is still, um, but let me just tell you what I can't say publicly. <laughs> which is that I went down last month to Mexico City. And um, it, it was a conference organized by the business communities of Monterey and Mexico City. Indi these, these two business meet independently had come to, and what you have are significant business leaders, people with a lot of money, who say the drug war is killing us, and who are willing and open to talking about legalization and what that might mean. And they're galvanized. By the way, this was the first conference I ever went to where like all the international experts were flowing their business class. I mean, it was like, you know, when you work in our world, you know, there's not money there. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, got, I was helping the guys who the Mexicans organized a conference, and they said, well, who are the public health experts uh, that we should invite? And I said, well, there's, you know, this guy in Canada, and Australia, Switzerland, Denmark, Portugal, blah, blah, blah. Next thing I know, they all had business class things in Mexico City. And what was interesting was that these businessmen didn't just pay for this thing. They sat in the front row for three days and listened and learned. And they had the oath to invite the president who sent his first lady and his interior minister. There were guys in military uniforms and police uniforms sitting there listening. There was not just print media, but television media, a dozen or more television cameras. I mean, it was a sort of, I've never been to an event where the business community was engaged and that hit at that level, right? Then, that, that day, it's not really possible to talk off the record here, is it? Yeah. No, it's not. No. It's not. <laughs> well, that day I had an opportunity to go and speak with Mexican officials at the highest levels of government, shall we say. And, and, and to talk about what it might look like for them to step out in a serious way about opening up this debate, right? And I held out two examples. The first one was, uh, Eisenhower's, the famous, I hope most of you have heard of this, you know, his farewell address in January 1961 where President Eisenhower wars of the ominous looming power, the growing power of the military industrial complex. And when Eisenhower, the war hero, the leader of World War II, the Republican, you know, you know, lot cons conservative, not in the conservative sense of the, the, the craziness of today, but the conservative 1950 sense, you know, said that, it was electrifying. And the other model, <coughs> I suggested was the op-ed piece that John D. Rockefeller wrote in the New York Times in 1932, where John D. Rockefeller, wealthiest man in America in the first third of the kind of the first third of this last century, had been the leading financial supporter of the alcohol prohibition movement. And in 1932, he gives a speech and he says, I hate alcohol. I've been a teetotaler all my life. I wish we could have gotten rid of alcohol. But I've now come to the conclusion that the cure I advocated is doing more harm than good. And that in terms of the violence and corruption, disrespect for law, social blah, 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 that we need to move into another world. And that other world is not to go back to the bad old days of the saloons and alcoholism rampant, but to a more so, so, you know, intelligent, thoughtful, regulatory model. He appointed the head of the Rockefeller Foundation to come up with various models of alcohol control from around the world. And that, that letter also had an electrifying impact that the richest guy in America, highly respected, had come out this way. And I said to the Mexican at the high level, Levels, think about this. 
think about this. And I was pleased when a week later, the Foreign Minister of Mexico, Patricia Espinosa, for the first time said publicly that Mexico now supports a debate on legal on legalization. Right? conference made any difference because in fact the, the presidents who have been involved in the Global Commission, uh, you know, Santos from, uh, not Santos, uh, 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 Gaviria from Colombia, Cardoso from Brazil, had also been talking about this, but what we know is that something was happening. And then I made these plans to go down to Guatemala. Um, you know, Central America was absent from this discussion. And as I'm planning to go down there to speak to the university, do some media, meet with the business group, right? The president, Otto Curtis Molina, out of nowhere, right, says, we gotta talk about legalization. And I was mystified. He had actually showed up in my office in New York four and a half years ago. And he'd come in because he had a bad advisor presentation talk to me, shows up, we spend an hour, and I'm saying, if you're gonna do the mono dura on the one hand, crack it down, then you at least gotta open the dial on the other hand. And he looked at me like I was crazy, like he'd never heard this stuff before. He left, he lost the election four years ago, I forgot about it, then he wins the election a few months ago. He comes in, I call my friend who was advising him, he said, yeah, go on down. I go on down, and all of a sudden, it's in the media everywhere. And all of a sudden, I start getting invited to meet with people at a higher and higher and higher level in the government in a way that I won't get into specifics with, but they were higher and higher. And, and, and finally, I get a chance to, to say, you know, well, look, you know, and I have an opportunity to tell them about my meetings in Mexico and to talk about what the business community is doing here. And that was the business community in, in, in Guatemala that's interested, you know? And, and, and then what, what does it, and one of the things I'm saying to them is, well, you know and I know to do so is not only politically impossible, but if anybody actually had the guts or craziness to do it, it would mean being ostracized. It would mean being, you know, having your train shut off, your plane's not allowed to fly. I mean, every passenger on your plane is being struck. I mean, you know, there are all the horrific things that, that, that the U.S. and many other governments would do that anybody that went it alone. But this is, and this was my pitch to them, about them playing an historic role in the evolution from the failed global drug prohibition regime of the 20th century to an, inter an alternative drug control regime of the 21st century grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. That that's the <laughs> Creating the opening and the dialogue and the intellectual energy and the political movement so that their children and grandchildren, and our children and grandchildren, and your children and grandchildren do not have to live in a world like the drug war world of today. Do not have to live in a world where half of the people are behind bars in America for, uh, for, 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 for violating the drug laws tonight, where millions of people have a drug conviction, where hundreds of thousands of people died of HIV AIDS because we couldn't do what the science told us to do, where black markets worth three or four hundred billion dollars a year wash around funding all sorts of organized and unorganized criminals, where territories being taken over in many countries by the gangsters who are in this only because this business is illegal, where human rights are being violated everywhere and people are being tortured because they're involved in all this sort of stuff. It's about creating a world where that is no longer true. And for them, for a leader of today to think about a generation hence, that's what leadership is about. That's what leadership is about. The fact of the matter is that sort of leadership is possible. You know, it's interesting, I look for example at, I'll take for example just two mayors. The former Mayor Daly of Chicago and Mayor Bloomberg of New York City, right? Now, both of them are fascinating characters. They've both been totally committed to their cities. They both have been there with vision. They both have been bad on drug war stuff. They were relatively okay on harm reduction stuff. In fact, you know, Bloomberg, the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health is a Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's a good, you know, public health directors. But you all know what he's done on the marijuana arrest and letting his NYP commissioner, you know, run rampant and arresting 50,000 people a year, the racial disproportionality and all that sort of stuff. 
But the other thing, Sheriff Daly wasn't very good at this stuff too. Horrific racial disproportionality, crazy arrest policies, all this sort of stuff. But then you look what they're trying to do on the environmental side. And what you see is you increasingly have leaders at the municipal level, sometimes the national level, who realize that the environmental solutions that what we need to deal with, with climate change and the urban development and the future of cities and life in, in America and around the world requires the long-term vision. Right? You read the article about how you know the, the trees that are planting in Chicago are the trees that will serve our trees that come from the south because they know the climate is going to be changing a generation from now. It's about creating green roofs and all these other sorts of ways and new forms of, 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 of fiscal account, of accounting so that you take into account environmental consequences, right? And you see current political leaders beginning to speak like visionaries about the environment. And we know that to the extent that we have a future on planet Earth with a world that we can live in and thrive, it's going to require the sort of political leadership, the visionary leadership from the politicians of today and tomorrow. Tomorrow. What's been missing, of course, is that sort of vision in the politicians of today, right? Who is planting out that vision? And what we're beginning to see is some of them emerging. You know, in the United States, Jim Webb, the senator from Virginia, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a little shame right now because he stepped out so boldly when he came to office. You know, he was standing out, he was sounding like we sound like. You know, I mean, literally, he was basically going, there's a war on drugs. The first bill, he created a bill to try to create a national commission on criminal, you know, looking at the criminal justice drug policy system. The language that he wrote in his own hand was about looking at European approaches, looking at alternatives to the current law. I mean, he did it. But because he's been so focused on trying to get this bill through, he stopped speaking out in the way, right? Now you see Rand Paul, hey, Rand Paul, son of Ron Paul, right? And there he is, almost single-handedly, standing up to the political establishment, the bipartisan drug war establishment in the U.S. Senate, saying, I'm not going to sign off on some bill that automatically criminalizes every substance that's ever been synthesized without any sort of, you know, you know due process, any sort of scientific analysis, and basically standing up and putting a hold on this stuff. And we'll see how long he can hold on to this stuff. So you never know when it's going to come through. But what you see is that some people are providing leadership. It's what Kurt Schmoke, the mayor of Baltimore in the late 1980s began to do. It's what Rocky Anderson, the mayor of Salt Lake City in the late 90s began to do, right? It's what Gary Johnson, the former governor of New Mexico, began to do. It's what President Santos in Colombia is doing. And it is what Otto Perez Molina, the first ever former general to do this. You know, President Santos, well, you know, when, I, 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 let me just back up for a second. I mean, I'm just thinking, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry this is less, less coherent than normal just because so much is happening right now, I'm just processing it, and I'm just thinking like a year ago, a year ago, there was no global, I mean, there was a global commission on drugs and drug, on drug policy, but it did not come out with its report as yet. You know, you had presidents, you know, Calder, you know, I mean, very respected former presidents from Brazil and Colombia and Mexico, you know, uh, Cardoso and Gaviria Zedillo, but then you had George Schultz, the former Republican secretary of, like, everything, you know, and Paul <laughs> Volcker, the former Federal Reserve chair, you know, uh, and then you had, you know, Richard Branson, who just seems on fire with this thing now, and then you have the guy who's heading the Global AIDS Fund, and then you have the former European Union Security Minister, and then you have other leading intellectuals, I mean, you know, and then they come out with a report that was about not just breaking the taboo, not just ending the drug war, not just in favor of harm reduction, but spoke about moving forward with cannabis legalization and looking into experiments in legally regulating other drugs, and which said that harm reduction principles have to be applied not just to drug users, but also to the people getting arrested for low-level drug selling and, and, and drug smuggling, and whoa! I mean, this was serious. And that report came about. Why? Because of us. Because we've been putting those ideas out there for a decade or two. Because we've been cultivating those relationships. Because when these guys needed to know what they needed to say, their instincts were in the right place. Their instincts were in the right place. But how did you flesh it out? What did you say? What were the particulars? What were the models? Where were they coming to? They were coming to from the people from the drug policy reform movement. When that report was being shaped and drafted, guess who was shaping it and drafting it? When it was being publicized and pitched and the media was sympathetic, it was because there was 
already a pre-existing drug policy reform community, they can take an opportunity like that and distinguish people who wanted to step up, who could get the public eye in a way that we could not at our level, and could make stuff happen, right? And then, when you get a guy like President Santos in Colombia, former defense minister under a drug war, President Uribe in Colombia, and he steps up and he's, I mean, he's a fascinating guy. Pay attention to Santos in Colombia, former defense minister from one of the most famous kind of Kennedy-like families in Colombia. And turned out, 14 years ago, when we did that public letter to the UN, he had signed the thing, so we knew he was interesting. And then what did he do in September of 2010? He convenes a meeting in Colombia a little summit of five Latin American leaders. And what's the subject? The subject is, what are the Prop 19 wins? <laughs> this is one reason why Prop 19 was such an immense victory, even though it did not win in the polls. And he convenes this, and they come out of there, and publicly they say, well, you know, Prop 19, this would just be bad because people in Latin America are dying to provide Americans with the drugs that they consume. And privately, He's letting it be known that he and others hope it wins. Hope it wins. And the same thing is coming out of the Mexican government. I mean, you know, politicians almost by definition talk out of both sides of their mouth, but this guy does it really well. <laughs> and he does it for good, as far as I can see. And you know what else he's doing? As is on the Molina, they're not just spouting out, they're talking to people. They're talking to academics, they're talking to experts, they're listening and they're learning. So what we're beginning to have at the highest levels is a level of thoughtful strategizing about how to move this thing forward, right? So Santos now, you know, once the Global Commission comes out, he makes a little statement in favor, and then he starts stirring up a little bit, and he gets an interview saying, well, you know, I think the world will be better off if we legalize cannabis. Columbia's not going to do it first. And then he has another interview, another interview, and this stuff, right? And then, you got Calderon, you know, who's got the moral authority, he's waged this war against organized crime, he's fought this battle, he doesn't want to admit defeat, but he's got the moral authority, the sacrifices that his government has paid to try to get the upper hand, even though they haven't really succeeded, but then he comes to America, and not only does he say, well, you guys should stop sending us all these guns, and you should reduce your demand, he's saying, if you cannot reduce your demand, maybe it's time to look for market alternatives. Market alternatives, huh? <laughs> and then there's a gathering called the Tuxla Declaration where other Latin American presidents come together and that gets in there as well, right? So you have a level of sophistication that's coming together, right? Now what's happening, I think, and this is how I'm thinking as of the last month or two, and it's about taking the two most dynamic elements that are going on, right? And here's the two, I mean, the stuff around reducing sentences and the crack powder reforms and any of the drug-free school zone bullshit and all this sort of stuff is important. Reducing our people behind bars and doing what, all important. But the two dynamic things that are going on right now, one is outside the United States, right? That is where you have the conversation around, around alternatives to prohibition, decriminalization, and listen, don't be, when, when, all of a sudden, when most of the Central Americans come out this evening and say we're against it, do not be put off, because it's the first step of opening it up. The Summit of the Americas, when the Obama, you know, look, uh, but Santos doesn't want to embarrass Obama when he goes down to Cartagena, Colombia next month, you know, for this whole thing. But the discussion will come up, and even though it'll be poo poo poo, it's opening up, it's opening up. This is a multi-year, multi-decade process. Right? So what's coming out is that more and more we're going to let the elites, mostly at the elite level, from the political, the diplomatic, the intelligence, military, security, business, you know, media, talking to their counterparts in America and Europe and other parts of the world. It's also going to be, of course, people like Javier Cecilia, the left-wing poet who's leading the social movement in Mexico, and a range of others. And it's going to be the activist groups, the human rights activists, and the student groups, and SSDP, you know, Mexico and Latin America, and all of these things coming up. But it's going to be that level, especially at the elite level, beginning to stir up and mix up the American elites in Washington and elsewhere. And then, what is the other most dynamic element going on in the world today? It is marijuana reform in the United States. Because the irony is this. The irony is, the irony is this. America, which for a century has been the leader of the global war on drugs, 
is now at the level of civil society, public opinion, and state government becoming the global leader on marijuana reform. The fact that there are now more, I believe, more medical marijuana dispensaries operating above ground in California and in Colorado each than there are coffee shops in Netherlands, that there are a million people who now have medical marijuana ID cards, maybe more, that one state after another is moving in that direction. The fact that we have legalization issues on the ballot in Washington and Colorado, or maybe Oregon, we'll see, right, that this stuff is moving forward, and whether we win or don't win this year, we are coming back in 2014 and 16, and we are going to win eventually, and the demographics, everything else on our side. The fact of the matter is that the latter, when we're down in Mexico and in Central America, what they're asking about is, are the legalization issues going to win? <laughs> they're paying attention to what's going on in Colorado right now. They want to know when California's going to be on the ballot again. So this element, with what we're doing and driving and pushing and pushing and pushing at this level, is taking is something that is being paid attention to throughout the world and especially in Latin America. It gives us the opportunity, as we said in that DPA, you know, e alert yesterday. Let the Latin American governments know that within America, our diplomats no longer speak for America when it comes to this issue right here. Think about it. this is a pincer move on the federal government, right? The, ultimately, the federal government of the United States is the target. And the elites are going to get hit from Latin America there and hit from our level around marijuana reform here. Hopefully, we can run out beyond marijuana to include all the harm reduction and sentencing reform and racial justice and all the other important things. But marijuana being the dynamic element. That, we know that this is not an issue on which the White House or Congress can or ever will lead. We know that the repeal of alcohol prohibition was not led from Washington. It was led from the cities and the states and the public coming out and changing their laws. And here's going to be the principal challenge for us, both domestically and internationally. It is going to be that while this momentum keeps going, it's how we manage this. So how we manage the conflict between the federal government and state governments over the next two and five and 10 and 20 years how we manage the fact that the feds have the Constitution, and at least as it's currently interpreted, and the law on their side of the Supremacy Clause, but we have the politics and the public and the morality on our side, how we negotiate that, all the struggles around medical marijuana, all the absurdity, the stuff that Stevie D and all the other medical marijuana folks are, are dealing with day after day, and the ATF and IRS and all this stuff, our ability to be smart and sophisticated and savvy about managing that and negotiating that, not jumping too soon, being careful whether it's legal cases or whether it's political action, not to set it up where we take two steps forward and then get pushed back three for three, four, or five. It's being sophisticated and having those things. That is going to be our number one challenge in terms of the maturation of our movement domestically. And internationally, the analogy is the same that as countries begin to break off, whether it's a Bolivia or a Guatemala or a Colombia or a Netherlands or a Switzerland or some other new country emerging, a new government emerging, how they manage the evolution, right, from being a country that begins to diverge from the international consensus as it crumbles, while all the conventions and institutions and bureaucracies are on the other side, international laws on this side, that where they have the momentum and politics and the morality, managing that also, is going to require incredible nuance and sophistication. You know what I know? I know that you guys are up for it. I know that you realize that this is a challenge, not just about advocating for marijuana legalization, but this is a challenge about bringing our intellect and our minds to bear. This is about the senior thesis you're going to write and the masters and PhD thesis you're going to write. This is about what you're going to do as lawyers. This is about what you're going to do in government. This is what you're going to do when you go to work for some corporation and they tell you that they're going to drug test you and you say, fuck you, I'm out. <laughs> the long-term commitment to recognize your children have a place in this too, what it means to take sacrifices and stand up personally, and to be as incredibly smart and thoughtful and strategic as you possibly could be. God bless you. Thank you very much.